Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Morgan Hafner, Assistant Editor with Becker's Healthcare. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of a, for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Stat and clicking Send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Also throughout today's webinar, we will have two poll questions for the audience. The poll questions will pop up directly on your screen, and then you can select your answer from the options and click Submit. Additionally, in about a week following the webinar, we will be sending you a copy of the presentation to the email you used to register. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenter. Dr. Don Casey is currently Chief of Clinical Affairs for MedDecision, which provides innovative utilization and care management solutions for more than 30 million Americans. Dr. Casey promotes Aerial, MedDecision's state-of-the-art population health management solution to healthcare organizations in their quest to achieve the triple aim through seamless and evidence-based care coordination. A board-certified primary care internist, Dr. Casey has practiced primary care, emergency medicine, and hospital critical care medicine in a variety of clinical settings for 19 years, including an inner-city federally qualified health center, a two-physician private practice, a large internal medicine teaching program group practice, and a multi-specialty group in a rural community providing full-risk capitated care to Medicaid patients. He has also served as a medical director for long-term care, palliative care, geriatric services, and home care organizations. Dr. Casey, I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, and um, good morning to everyone. Um, uh, I'm Don Casey. I think um, we have a big crowd today. Welcome to those on the East Coast. Uh, um, good afternoon, and to the rest of you, good morning. I really appreciate this. Um, on, on this slide, too, is, um, are some credentials I want to just go over. Uh, I am currently president of the American College of Medical Quality, a lead co-author of the hypertension guidelines that we're going to discuss today. I'm currently chairing uh, a performance measures writing committee for high blood pressure that is in process. And I have teaching appointments at Jefferson College of Population Health and also Rush Medical College in Chicago. Um, while I, I am working for MedDecision, the presentation today uh, is based upon my own um, knowledge and expertise and reflects my own opinion of uh, the content. So I'm going to uh, present to you um, the following. First, um, today we're going to define what population health means within the parameters of your own organization and community. Uh, this question comes up a lot. What is population health? So we'll touch on that a bit. And then I'm going to use the uh, problem of high blood pressure to address critical importance of focusing on this as a major priority for health systems and also payers as well. This is really a national problem. It isn't confined to one part of the health delivery system. Uh, the third point is to really understand the importance of population health strategies designed to diagnose and treat hypertension or high blood pressure, which we'll talk about. And then lastly, and most importantly, and most exciting to me, is to recognize that one of the keys to improving hypertension care now is really for you to become much more familiar with the clinical and administrative uh, aspects of the guidelines in the context of health system leadership, and also the people who are in the delivery system with, uh, for example, care managers, population health experts, primary care clinicians, and um, really the team that's focused on this. So the, the important part of starting with population health is really to define that term within the parameters of your own community. And in particular, um, the first question is, what is the population or populations that we want to focus on? I know probably all of you have gone through this process and are dealing with several at once. And today, we're going to speak about a big population, as you'll see. Health systems uh, and health plans really should focus on the challenges of costly conditions impacting communities 
to make the biggest impact. But I want to emphasize this is not a presentation on the cost of care. It's a presentation on improving the quality of care with the expectation that doing a better job will have a significant impact on the cost. And to show you how big this issue is, recent estimates from the American Heart Association published this year shows that now over 100 million Americans have high blood pressure in the context of these new guidelines that we'll emphasize and that consequences of inadequate treatment uh, include more cardiovascular disease, stroke, renal failure, and early death for this very important high-risk population. And finally, our practice guideline, the HAACC guideline, really should be a template for action to improve the care of patients with this condition and ultimately the health of a big population. So I'm gonna just spend a quick minute talking to you about the population health management market. Uh, and in particular, I was very proud of myself because I put together this word cloud, not bad for a doctor. Uh, the size of the fonts aren't determinant of the, of the size of the population, but I, I put them in here really to show you that there's a large group in here. I, I neglected the federally qualified health centers, um, so I apologize for that. But, but in essence, every, every name and acronym on this slide relates to the problem of population health management. And so it's a very broad and highly diverse uh, group. And of course, all of these entities are actively involved in risk bearing and are investing in population health management solutions. Now, these are not the only items for success in population health. Those of you who do this day to day know that there's a lot more to it. But, but in particular, I wanted to highlight critical elements. These are necessary, by no means sufficient. Change management, good data, intervention tools and reporting. For example, change management involves clinician engagement and accountability and responsibility, including interacting with teams. Data in, requires us to develop seamless integration of data from multiple sources. We want to use enhancing technology to uh, group patients properly, risk adjust them, and do some predictive modeling, which you're doing now. We also need a good place where this data can exist in a way that's usable. It's not just about having a big uh, file of claims data or electronic health records data. The data that's now being used in population health is coming from multiple sources at once. And so having that technology to do that is really important. Patient registries are emerging as important and risk stratification for high, low, and rising risk patients is important. But in the end, um, what we need to pay attention to is what to do once we've identified the people that we think need the most help uh, in the population that we're serving. So using guidelines, protocols, and algorithms, developing workflows that are patient-centered and provider-centered to encourage high-touch care coordination, using uh, utilization tools for revenue, revenue recognition, cost management, reduction, and network, leak, network leakage, common issues that come up in, in contracts where we're responsible for population health and patient activation tools and web capabilities for engaging uh, the consumers, especially in shared decision making. And then fourthly, under reporting, being sure that the data wraps up into real-time actionable information that can now be used to intervene at the point of care, but also measure the performance of individual uh, clinicians and also uh, teams and ultimately organizations who are involved with global risk performance. I highlighted here quickly what we're doing at MedDecision just to show you one example of the way the market is, is evolving. Uh, and we're involved with integration and, and uh, aggregation of data. As I pointed out, we really do want to be sure that the content management is uh, synchronized relative to the provider health market. 
workflow, analytics and reporting and engagement um, are really key. And we see this very much in the provider population health management IT market, uh, especially related to uh, engagement of care teams across service lines inside and outside of provider organizations. From the standpoint of payers, we're seeing some different needs, including the need to automate clinical rules to minimize the manual intervention required to do the types of work that you're doing, mobility and ease of use around allowing care and case managers to use technology in a mobile way. Uh, configurable is really important because of the fact that this is an ever-changing world, especially on the health plan side with respect to regulations, new programs, and the need to build assessments and reports, and more uh, to do with um, limited or no IT involvement. In other words, the less we can spend time at the machine trying to figure it out and enable high-touch care the better we're going to be in terms of um, enabling the work that's being done. Obviously, integration with external vendors, especially EMR vendors, is important. Um, and in particular, health plans, I know, are very intent on getting that information in the same way that providers are very intent on getting information from payers. So that's the convergence of the data quality and aggregation that I spoke about before, but there's data coming from multiple sources everywhere. And so this is really becoming more and more of a challenge in order to make sense of the information, which is critical. And integrating with internal solutions, everyone I know has some investments already in some aspect of the functions that I've talked about. And so this isn't um, the, 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 the Necessary, necessary expectation that what uh, you need is going to be replaced, but certainly it needs to fit in with the information and the, and the processes that you've got, especially in a modular fashion. And then scalability is also important. Payers have multiple lines of business. I think that's becoming much more prevalent on the provider side, but very clearly uh, being able to segregate required data and, and enable instances for for example, JV and ACO partners where both sides are cooperating is of utmost importance. So uh, it, in essence, this is our example of working with big data through collection, aggregation, and validation, using interventions to achieve robust uh, clinical, operational, and financial care outcomes, especially in the context of care management care coordination and utilization management, consumer engagement of patients through social media and mobile apps, making sure that the clinicians who are impacting and interfacing with these systems have it such that the right thing to do is the easy thing to do. I think this has become the holy grail of all of the above that I've spoken about. And then lastly, being sure that the system gives us information that can actually help us make decisions about making improvements and measuring and reporting performance. So that's sort of a brief overview of population health. Um, I wanna take uh, time now to really use high blood pressure as a great example of how this all translates into real world opportunities for you today. Uh, and I'll start with emphasizing the risk. And this word is going to highlight throughout the rest of my presentation, but in essence, blood pressure control is directly correlated with cardiovascular disease risk. And this is actually an old slide, so it's not new, but you can see at each level of age categories, age deciles, all the way up to 80 to 89, the correlation between systolic blood pressure on the left and diastolic blood pressure on the right correlates with rising risk of mortality, ischemic heart disease mortality on the y-axis. And this is well known and not something that's changed um, much uh, over the time. So it highlights why we care a lot about blood pressure control in this context. The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or what is commonly referred to 
as N. Haynes has shown too that, and these are old data, I'll show you new data in a moment, that about 46% of the population measured as having high blood pressure in 2013 to 14 was deemed to be uncontrolled, about at that time 35 million people. And on the right, um, and these, this slide is from my colleagues at the AMA, uh, what's striking is that only with, that more than half are really either unaware or aware but untreated. So we've got a big challenge with control of adults with uncontrolled hypertension now in, in the face of this problem. I took these data from NCQA's website uh, because I wanted to highlight that over time, many of you involved with health plans understand this, the, the HEDIS measure for controlling high blood pressure really has changed very modestly over a period beginning in 1999 to now. And the trends are on the right side according to these different types of health plans. You can get these data directly off the website of NCQA. The uh, in 2017 figures I don't think are quite up yet, but uh, you can see that the specifications here show that we're looking primarily at blood pressures of less than 140 over 90. I should point out that the old measure also included for diabetics a, a threshold of 150 over 90, but it looks like, according to NCQA, that we're likely going to lower that to 140 over 90. I know the final specifications for this measure are not out, but you get the point. We're, we're still way below where we need to be in terms of achieving maximum success for our populations. In addition, recent data published by the uh, American Heart Association in uh, May of this year shows now that national medical costs associated with hypertension are accounting for about $131 billion in annual healthcare expenditures, and that's been averaged over 12 years. Uh, it turns out that individuals with high blood pressure face nearly $2,000 on average higher annual healthcare expenditures compared to those without hypertension. And the incremental costs associated with high blood pressure have remained steady from 2013 to 2014. The um, expenditures associated with high blood pressure are also shifting from the inpatient to the outpatient settings. And hence, this, these findings really warrant intense effort to improve hypertension prevention and management. And if we look at this graph from that article that I just highlighted, which is referenced here, you can see a substantial difference between the population uh, with high blood pressure and those with no hypertension in terms of total inpatient, outpatient, prescription, and emergency room visits. So we have an audience poll um, to start off with, and I'm going to let the, uh, the Becker's group uh, open the poll and proceed with it. Thank you, Dr. Casey. Our first poll question will be, how would you classify your healthcare organization? A, hospital system, B, physician organization, C, health plan, D, public health organization, or E, other? And we will give you a few moments to answer the poll before we review the results. Thank you all for answering the poll. 47% of you answered that you are part of a health system, 8% are part of a physician organization, 7% are part of a health plan, 9% are part of a public health organization, and 34% of you are other. Thank you so much, and I'll pass it back to Dr. Casey. Well, and thank you, because uh, it's good to know that. I'm not surprised, given that I know Becker's has a broad reach with the provider side, um, and I, I don't, didn't expect um, health plans to be front and center, but very clearly the challenge that I want to face uh, focus on today is really to you, health systems, uh, to really try to get at this problem differently than you've been. So 
let's move to talking about the 2017 ACCHA guideline for prevention, detection, evaluation, and management of high blood pressure in adults. And this was a very unique experience. I've been involved with writing guidelines now for about, you know, I'll, I'll just say it, 30 years. And um, I think what's really great is that we began in 2014. It's hard to believe we're almost to four years now. But a 21-member multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary writing committee was appointed actually through NIH and the ACCHA to develop this guideline consisting of multidisciplinary teams of cardiologists and other specialties. So you can see from this list that we had broad representation of clini clinical types, including some lay patient representatives, as well as 11 different professional organizations, which were not just physician organizations. Uh, participating in this, and no writing committee member had a relevant relationship with industry uh, on this list. So this is the, uh, the list of lead authors, or co-authors, I should say. Those of you that are familiar with ACCHA understand that they use, we use a well-defined taxonomy for classification of a recommendation, which is a strength of a recommendation and also the level and quality of evidence. I put this up here because for two reasons. One is that if you're not familiar with it, basically the 1A, the one class, and the A quality of evidence highlights the fact that from a hierarchical standpoint, these are the most important recommendations in terms of what is said in the medical literature and in well-defined systematic reviews to be of highest benefit uh, exceeding risk. And as we go down the list on the left, you can see that we move from strong, moderate, weak to uh, actual no benefit and harm. These are actually meant to mirror some of the other modalities by which guidelines are developed, such as the US Preventive Services Task Force, and others. Uh, so it's unique to ACCHA, but there is this notion of it. And I want you to keep in mind these colors and class of recommendation and level of evidence, because I'm going to show you some slides of specific rec some of the specific recommendations. I think there are over 100 in this guideline, and I'm only highlighting a few that use this taxonomy. And I, these slides will be available for you, I believe, after the presentation, so there's no need to write this down now. I also wanted to point out that this guideline is a continued work in progress related to the effort that AHA, the Heart Association, and the College of Cardiology have been putting forth to modernize our efforts. I know that I still hear this adage in some presentations that it takes 17 years for evidence to reach practice, uh, 17 being also the life cycle of a cicada. But I would also posit now with the modernization efforts that that statement is actually 17 years out of date because we really tried to develop much more real-time guideline development and authoring and as well as delivery and consumption. And we're really focused on not just publishing guidelines but getting them into practice and looking at the, the impact that these have. So a lot more about this to come, but I simply wanted to highlight that we really believe that our efforts are really cutting edge and at the forefront of trying to improve care in real time. Today I'm going to pick out what I think are the most important highlights. There are many other aspects of this guideline, and I think for those of you who are in these population health efforts, you can really use this guideline, which runs about almost 500 pages when you look at it from top to bottom, is a well-crafted resource for both getting easy determination of what the right thing to do is for specific aspects of this, but also for those who are very analytical, trying to dig into evidence and tables that, that are in the back of this guideline to give you more information about how these recommendations were crafted and, and came to consensus. So today I'm going to talk because I think these are the most relevant to health systems about a new blood pressure classification system. 
I'm going to focus on the physicality of blood pressure measurement. This is, to me, of all the things in this guideline, probably the utmost of importance from my standpoint as a clinician. I'm going to talk about new approaches to treatment decisions for the management of hypertension. In particular, I'm going to show you the lower targets of blood pressure during treatment of hypertension for certain patients uh, and clarify that we're not talking about lowering everyone's blood pressure as low as we can get it. And then lastly, the strategies that we we have found to be most important to actually improve, improve blood pressure control during treatment of hypertension. So the way I think of this is it's the why we've talked about that because blood pressure is a silent killer still. We've talked, we're going to talk about the what, and we're going to also talk about the how, and, and that's where I want to end this uh, presentation, giving you some practical tools that you can actually start this afternoon after this, after this uh, call. So first of all, what's changed with our approach to population health in the context of classification of blood pressure? Well, the Here's the uh, recommendation and level of evidence here, uh, a strong recommendation, level of evidence, be non-randomized, uh, which is moderate quality, but still very high, showing that blood pressure should be categorized as normal, elevated, or stages one or two hypertension in order to prevent and treat high blood pressure. And I put this up here because, quite frankly, this is not going to show up in claims data the way that ICD-10 is configured. So those of you who go looking for this terminology will not find the new taxonomy that I'm going to show you. And I think that, from my own opinion, it's time to, to move past claims. Not that they aren't helpful, but they are by no means sufficient in terms of helping with this classification. And in particular, what's changed is if we look back to the JNC7, which was published a few years ago, you can see the new taxonomy on the right that is replaced. And, and really, mainly what's different is we've, we've moved the old stage one and stage two, that is anything above 140, to stage two hypertension on the right. And we've now created a new stage, which was previously called hypertension, pre-hypertension, I should say, to including the 130 over 139. We decided that we wanted to eliminate prehypertension because that sounds like it isn't an issue, but there actually is some, some incremental risk of having blood pressures that are higher than 120 uh, around cardiovascular risk. So we call it a elevated blood pressure. And then normal blood pressure, which remains the same. Our target is still mainly uh, for most individuals to achieve control below 120 systolic and diastolic 80. Blood pressure really should be based on the average of two readings, and we'll talk about that, on more than two occasions. And adults with both categories should be designated into the higher category if they're different. Uh, so in other words, if your diastolic is stage one and your systolic is stage two, for practical purposes, you should be categorized as stage two. If we now look at the new data, according to N. Haynes, which I mentioned before, you can see in this middle bar that we've now in, we're now including a population of those in the 130 to 139 range over 80 to 89. In other words, the new stage one, which means that according to these estimates, the prevalence of hypertension now, as defined by some recent studies done this year, I think in the July issue of JAMA cardiology. If you get JAMA cardiology, you can actually pull this out uh, right after the call to see the data. But we're now at 40, almost 46% of our population, which by rights is about 105 million people, according to this new taxonomy. Quite striking. Secondly, here, we're talking about not just the level of blood pressure, but the risk. And this is important to emphasize to you. This isn't anymore the situation where I've got a number, which is my blood pressure, 
and the doctor gave me a pill, the clinician gave me a pill. This is about knowing what my risk and risk factors are before I make a decision about what what to do, be, the, be I a clinician or a patient. And these are not new. You can actually get this, this risk calculation off the website. Uh, I'll show you the link in a minute, but the two categories of risk factors here for basically cardiovascular disease are modifiable, such as the ones on the left. Again, I'm not going to read them. You've seen them. And then relatively risk, relatively fixed risk factors like chronic kidney disease. Age is really important. Uh, other things here that are um, some, somewhat indeterminate in terms of what can be done about them for the most part. So let's now talk about accurate measurement. And as I said, if there's one top takeaway from this, it's what I'm going to tell you now. And that is based upon a finding recently that showed that um, blood pressure was inaccurately measured in a study of 159 medical students. Only one got a perfect score in terms of what actually is supposed to be done correctly to measure blood pressure. And this is a real challenge because if you think about it, most of us are operating in a situation in a health system where we're using measurements that are done incorrectly to make decisions about treatment and advice. And that's really a big challenge. So we spent a lot of time talking about both the consistency and accuracy in terms of the correct way to measure. And for our purposes, this was based upon expert opinion, but a very strong recommendation that we believe that employing proper methods are recommended for accurate measurement and documentation of blood pressure. And we have a checklist in the guideline that comes out of a scientific statement that actually was published 13 years ago showing the importance of this from a measurement standpoint and a biometric standpoint. So properly preparing the patient, using the proper technique, taking the proper measurements needed for both diagnosis and treatment of elevated blood pressure and hypertension, documenting the accurate readings, you know, which measures do we use, averaging the readings accordingly, and then providing the readings to the patient. And this checklist applies to both health system slash clinical slash office-based measurement, as well as ambulatory and home blood pressure measure measurement. So it's the same set of steps that we think have to be recreated. And I borrowed this again from my colleagues at AMA and the Heart Association. We'll talk a little bit about target BP. Again, these things are easily gettable on the website, but you can see there's a whole lot of steps that have to be achieved in order to get an accurate reading. And when I first show this to especially busy primary care doctors, they're like, I'm being a little unkind to them, but one of the responses is, I don't really have time to do all this. And I would posit that this probably is something now, in my opinion, that can be turned over to non-lead uh, clinical folks and done in a measurement way, in a more consistent way, and doesn't have to take up time if you configure the care delivery process to, to achieve this. But mainly it's common sense, avoiding smoking and drinking coffee before you come in, waiting at least 30 minutes after a meal, measuring your blood pressure before you take medicine. You can read all this. I'm not gonna go at it. But a lot of things are really important. This isn't the business of coming in with your shirt sleeve rolled down, having someone slap a blood pressure cuff haphazardly on your arm, just you know, talking to you while they're uh, measuring it and um, not allowing you to relax and prepare you ahead of time. So we have got to pay a lot more attention to this and I'll show you some strategies toward the end of this to help achieve this. But from my perspective, if we're not doing this correctly, we're starting off way on the wrong foot in terms of doing potential harm to our patients. 
The other thing is that where you measure the blood pressure is important. There are categories now, which we talked about, and I was the one that pushed for this table because it isn't always easy to remember, but we needed to be sure that we distinguished between measurements that occur in a healthcare setting, such as an office in a clinic, and those that occur in a non-healthcare setting, uh, with the important point that there are categories here, which believe it or not, the bottom two mask type retention, where blood pressure is actually present outside of the clinic and healthcare setting in an ambulatory setting, but not in the healthcare setting, and white coat hypertension, which is the opposite. It shows up high in the, in the doctor or nurse practitioner office, uh, but is not evident in ambulatory uh, settings as well, uh, with normotensive and sustained hypertension being the other two categories. So paying attention to this important, I read a, an article about mass hypertension just in the past day showing that patients with this problem actually do have a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease and comorbid and morbidity. So it's important to get this right in terms of where and how the blood pressure is measured. And we found strong evidence, strong quality of evidence, high quality and strong recommendation for using out of office and self monitoring of blood pressure in order to confirm the diagnosis, but also to titrate blood pressure lowering medications and other interventions in conjunction with telehealth and other clinical interventions. We'll talk about all this toward the end of the talk, but I wanted to highlight to you that, again, using these techniques is going to be really important. I'm sure you're all, if you're involved with hypertension care, doing it, but you've got to combine this with using the correct methods for obtaining the blood pressure. So let's talk about treatment. This slide actually helps to take the new taxonomy on the top part of the boxes and on the left side, the cardiovascular risk scoring with the greater than or equal to 10% being the high risk and those less than 10% on the left being low risk and categorizing them, them in terms of blood pressure lowering medications. And the first thing I wanna do before I get into the details of this table is actually to emphasize the first bullet below, which is anyone with these three categories of blood pressure regardless, all require intensive lifestyle modification, and that's a 1A rec, as you'll see. And secondly, from the standpoint of the elderly, we're not just talking about reflexively using a number to make a decision, especially for people who are older who, or who may have a risk of harm from having their blood pressure lowered too much. And sometimes people forget, they look at the guideline and say, well, this just is gonna result in a whole lot of old people going on medication that might be harmful. And if you really read this recommendation, which is in section 10, that was developed by my colleague, Jeff Williamson, a geriatrician from Wake Forest, who I have a very high regard for, this is basically showing you that what's important is to take into account for every patient a whole lot of factors in terms of making judgments about how low you want to go with blood pressure treatment and using a team-based approach as well. So just keep that in mind. We're talking about population health, but we're also talking about treating patients one at a time in terms of this context so that judgment is really important about what the risks of harm are. But back to the table, you can see that we believe that for both stage two and stage one, um, blood pressure lowering medications to achieve a target of lower, i.e. below 120, is the best approach for most patients. But you can see the that's for the high risk. You can see for the low risk for stage one, we're actually not recommending medication. We're, we're, we're measure, we're recommending, as you will see, lifestyle modification. And these are the non-pharmacologic interventions. Again, 1A, very high uh, quality of evidence and strong recommendation. None of this is surprising to any of you who 
are involved with this from a health standpoint, weight loss, heart healthy diet, such as DASH, to achieve desirable weight, sodium reduction, potassium supplementation, preferably by diet, not by pills, increased physical activity, and uh, alcohol consumption. These six are, I'm sure, lifestyle modifications that I think you could apply to all your patients, but in specific, are important for high blood pressure. A good an old colleague of mine who I've been writing guidelines with for many years calls this um, evidence from the journal of duh, right? These, these things have to be achieved and I'll get into how we achieve them. But what's important for you to remember is that each of these is mapped to a specific approximate impact on systolic blood pressure. So each of these interventions by themselves without medication can significantly lower blood pressure, not just for people with high blood pressure, but for people with normal blood pressure. So uh, as long as they're not causing harm, uh, these are really important to keep in mind. And, and you can see on the next slide, physical activity and alcohol intake have a significant impact you know, up to five millimeters of mercury, for example, for isometric resistance in terms of uh, achieving better control on the non-pharmacologic side. So I like to tell anyone who is new to the guideline that this is where you start with every patient who has the need for blood pressure control, regardless of what class they're in or what the risk category is. With respect to those that uh, need more treatment, obviously we wanna be able to guide drug treatment of hypertension. And these are our two main recommendations around in the first recommendation, using blood pressure lowering medications in particular for high risk patients uh, to achieve uh, a level of control if the systolic blood pressure is 130 or higher. This differs from the previous guidelines that have been published by both the JNC as well as recent guidelines from 2017 from AAFP and ACP. Uh, and then the second recommendation is once again uh, to use blood pressure lowering medications in the low risk stage two population. But as I pointed out, not the stage one for low risk. That's just lifestyle modification. And these are done both in conjunction with uh, intensive attempts at lifestyle modification. I did um, want to point out that I've got the link here that you can get after this presentation to the ACC uh, AHA risk estimator that is online that we used as the basis for estimating the 10-year risk of cardiovascular disease. So what can we do today to improve the treatment of high blood pressure. This is where we wanna get into the how. We have some very great recommendations here for strategies for high blood pressure control. And in particular, this first one is not just what we need to do, but how we need to do it. There's an elegant chapter for which I was the lead author on looking at specific effective and behavioral, effective behavioral and motivational strategies to achieve a healthy lifestyle in concordance with the lifestyle modification recommendations I mentioned before. And in this particular section of the guideline, which I think is in section 12, you can actually find more details on the evidence around these strategies that have been used effectively to influence blood pressure control, not just in general, but specifically to blood pressure control. We also think that a comprehensive care plan, which is now becoming a lot more complex than you think, should be part of every aspect of patients with hypertension and their care. And I'll go through this in a minute. Uh, and also actively monitoring patients on drug therapy for high blood pressure, a 1A recommendation. Again, the goal here was to emphasize the strong recommendation and the high quality of evidence for this in the context of what I talked about relative to home and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And then section 12 also talks about structured team-based care intervention. And again, 
the evidence was analyzed in the context of high blood pressure. And what's important is that a team isn't just a couple people with uh, credentials after their name. It's a combination of experts. In particular, two examples are advanced uh, practice nurses and pharma uh, pharmacists who can be very active in teams to help with treatment and care, both in terms of medication and lifestyle modification. We wanted to emphasize the evolving use of telehealth. Now, telehealth means multiple things, not just using a telephone, so you'll be happy to read that section, but the telehealth interventions are not standalone. They have to be in the context of everything else I'm talking about. They're enablers, but they're not by themselves uh, interventions around high blood pressure control. And then the use of electronic health records and patient registries also is becoming very well uh, in, uh, used and, and is starting to supplant claims-based uh, attempts at evaluating patients. In particular, I wanted to highlight a, a, an elegant study from the Annals of Family Medicine. Uh, a few years ago, one of my colleagues from AMA, Dr. Mike Raycotts, was the PI on this. And again, I'm not going to go through the details of it except to highlight in Table 1 that through the query of their electronic medical record based upon about 140,000 patients, they were able to find over 1,500 patients in that system by looking just at the blood pressure readings, uh, not the claims, to identify patients who they then brought in and by protocol were able to diagnose. And some of them actually were, were fairly poorly controlled. So in the midst of this EMR, there were a number of people who the system wasn't even aware of as having high blood pressure. In other words, there was no code for it. I mentioned the plan of care. I won't go through all of this, but it's here for you. Because, as I pointed out, this is the type of work that now needs to be done to be in concordance with what we recommend as the best care for high blood pressure. And this is including measuring the accurate blood pressure, looking for white coat hypertension or mast hypertension, uh, lifestyle interventions. I'm going to skip through this estimates of risk treatment with comorbidities. There's a lot in this guideline about comorbidities that I'm not talking about, which you'll find useful. Looking at patient characteristics, including social determinants of health, and being sure we have proper follow-up, team-based care, telehealth, what to do when we have non-adherence problems, and that's a multifactorial issue that I know you're all struggling with day-to-day. -day. I mentioned white coat uh, before, and then using health information technology for remote monitoring, self-monitoring of blood pressure. Very set, very complex set of things to remember and not something to be taken lightly here, but certainly a roadmap for success. You know, in the end, I know that those of you who do care management for a living understand that without connecting to patients and determining what it is they can actually accomplish is fraught with a challenge, and if you don't have a high-touch interaction with patients with high blood pressure, then it's going to be a lot harder, if not impossible, to engage them with improving control. And I like this. It's one model, but certainly the three-dimensional concept in a primary care setting, I think this data was from Germany, shows that if you measure willingness to participate, ability to participate, and whether the care needs are actually manageable. You have to take into account all three of these in order to achieve the goals of that plan of care that I spoke about. And these take a lot of work and time and effort with a, with a chronic problem that is uh, so prevalent. So I, I'm very sensitive to that, and I believe the guideline helps frame that. So we have it one last poll here, and then I'm going to move into the last part of my presentation, so I'm going to ask the team if they can bring that up, and let's see what we get. Thank you, Dr. Casey. The second poll question today is, which strategies are currently in active use by your organization 
slash practice to diagnose and treat high blood pressure. A, EHR and patient registry usage, B, telehealth offering, C, behavioral and motivational strategies, D, blood pressure self-monitoring, and E, formal comprehensive quality improvement program. And again, we'll give you a few moments to answer the poll before we review the results. They're able to check all that apply, right? Yes, you can select all that apply. Yes, please. This is going to be interesting. Thank you for your responses. 48% selected EHR and patient registry usage. 19% selected telehealth offerings. 53% selected behavioral and motivational strategies. 60, so the majority, selected blood pressure self-monitoring and 41% selected formal comprehensive quality improvement program. Thank you, thanks again for your responses, and I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Casey. Very interesting, and, and certainly I know that you're all doing some semblance of this, but it's interesting to see that these five strategies are all important, and so obviously you can only do so much in the beginning, but, but we really believe that we have to move towards enabling all of this. And telehealth, again, is kind of a wild card, but I think the guideline will help you sort that out in terms of what can be accomplished here. So the last part is really what can you do this afternoon? And I want to highlight again a great program that exists. This came off of a lot of work that was started a few years ago through the Million Hearts program. I'm sure some of you may have participated in that, and I know that some of you on the phone are probably involved with Target BP. But Target BP is a great program, and it's a call to action, really, to motivate you, the health provider community. We also think health plans uh, don't appreciate this opportunity to take advantage of great resources about the program. It allows us to give recognition to healthcare providers who attain high levels of blood pressure control, particularly those getting to 70% or higher, which is above that NCQA average that I spoke about. But most importantly, there's a huge set of resources here of standardized tools and assets for healthcare providers to use in practice. And what I've also found is that this is a great community in order to share, because I know having been around the country myself in many different places that it, how you implement population health strategies is going to show up differently. Uh, for example, the difference between Puerto Rico and Kansas City, uh, there's a lot in common, but there's also a lot of differences as one example. The preliminary data that was given to me by the AMA shows now that we have about 1,700 healthcare organizations participating in this, and that includes health systems and individual clinics and practices. This is in all 50 states and territories. About half have submitted data through the registry that is promoted by the BP recognition, pro target BP recognition program. There are about 36 million adults in this program. That's a huge number. And more than 8 million have a diagnosis of hypertension. So this isn't just for people with high blood pressure, but people at risk as well. On average, the blood pressure control rate is about 65.6%, which I think is pretty good. But we've now got a number of healthcare organizations that are above 70% and in the, in the control rate, uh, excellent group. We've got close to 78% on average. So very clearly, there is a chance through this program to really gain lots of leaps and bounds. And part of it is that there's a big approach to systems of care using the MAP control program. Again, I'm not going to go into this, but it re reflects a lot of what I've been talking about, including measuring accurately, which is the M, acting rapidly, which is achieving evidence-based therapies to reduce blood pressure uh, to safe levels, and then partnering with engagement through patients, families, and communities. And because we're in all 50 states and, and there's a whole lot of uh, effort, but a, a very robust peer group for you should you decide to join to get at 
the opportunities to interact and share because this program also works a lot at the bottom by facilitating factors which show up differently depending on where you sit around leadership, commitment of staff, teamwork, using QI tools, having confident and reasonable expectations, but best of all, having actionable data and sustaining the change. So conclusion is that these new guidelines actually are gonna pose major challenges and opportunities for the healthcare industry as I've outlined. I hope you'll take advantage of them. The diagnosis and treatment has become more complex and cannot be oversimplified. Using strategies that are enabled by technology to high quality evidence links can impact reduction of risk and related mortality, which I think is really important to the future of population health improvement. The evidence is continually changing. The ACCHA I know will continue to look at new evidence as it comes out, uh, but we wanna rely on the inter interventions with the highest impact like target BP. This is one example I'm sure you have others. And from my standpoint, my pet peeve is being sure that we measure blood pressure consistently and accurately, and also promote the interventions that can effectively promote lifestyle modification as our primary opportunities. So with that, I will take some questions. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to get your emails, so please feel free to follow up with me at my email address. There is the link to Target BP. Follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I'll turn the floor open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Casey, for that fantastic presentation. We will now be begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled, enter a question for staff and clicking send. We will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. And there are a ton of really great questions coming in. One question, Dr. Casey, um, a panelist or a listener is wondering, there are other high blood pressure guidelines out there right now. How do you decide which to follow? Yeah, that's a great question. Let me uh, pull up an, a slide here of my, fam my favorite table. If you think about other guidelines like ACP, A AFP, and by the way, I'm a member of ACP and I have a high regard for my professional society. Uh, the difference is that we, first of all, we all agree on 140 over 90 and above. That part is incontrovertible. And we also agree that taking individual preferences into account uh, are important. We believe that the ACCHA guideline is focused on a lower target and also including stage one. So. I don't view them as different. I view them as a difference of opinion. And to some extent, we still have to apply the same types of interventions. So I would say, depending on which camp you're in, um, you pick the one that you think is best suited to your population, but keep your eyes and ears open and your mind open for this. A lot of people are concerned about harms, and I get that. The estimates of harms that were outlined by Dr. Yancey in this JAMA cardiology uh, issue this month uh, showed that the risk of, over, of lowering blood pressure is far less than 1% in terms of actual harm, which is not to say harm doesn't occur. It's just that we tend to overestimate it. And I think most people now on, the, on our guidelines side believe that 130 over 80 should be the threshold by which we begin to treat with lifestyle modification for both high and low risk and also medication for the high risk. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Great. Thank you for clarifying that, Dr. Casey. And that was a really great question. It looks like we have time for one more question today. And an audience member is wondering, what role do patients play in both self-measurement and self-management of their blood pressure? Yeah, it's a great question too. I would say that if you don't have the patient engaged, you might as well forget it. We all know this. Anyone who treats high blood pressure knows that this is a challenge. From my perspective, talking about the risk of future events and talking about the impact of lifestyle modification on their blood pressure is important. And also 
the need for them to pay more attention to not just obtaining blood pressure measurements, but doing it correctly. I think if we just focused on those three things, we would come a long way in, in terms of helping patients understand what their opportunities are and why it's important for them today to really uh, think about this. Of course, many of us operate under complex circumstances. There are distressed areas where social determinants of health play a huge role in this. But I think all of us are becoming better and more knowledgeable about how we can interact with those types of patients as well. And in the end, we're going to do it one patient at a time. It's not about flipping a switch here. So with that, I will just say thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been an honor to present. I look forward to hearing from you. And please keep in touch with me. And again, thank Beckers and MedDecision for sponsoring this. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Casey, for your really informative answer. And thank you to the audience members for contributing great questions today. That is all the time we have time for. I want to thank Dr. Casey for the excellent presentation and to our audience for participating. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we look forward to having you for future webinars.